I now give the floor to the representative of the Syrian Arab Republic. Shukran. Thank you, Madam President. Madam President, over the past period of time following the latest Security Council session on the humanitarian situation in Syria, a number of meetings have taken place between Syria and UN representatives and specialized agencies and programs. As the Syrian government continues its constructive engagement with the UN and other partners to provide services and to improve the humanitarian situation and to support Syrians in need all around the country. Today we listened to the briefing by Mr. Martin Griffiths, Under Secretary General for Humanitarian Affairs, where he referred to his visit to Syria and the meetings he's held. We hope that this visit would contribute to correcting course in our relationship with OCHA and enhancing cooperation with the office according to the principles of humanitarian action set out in GA resolution 46 stroke 182 and the principles of professionalism and objectivity away from politicization and diktats by Western governments. Madam President, after a long period of obstruction by the Turkish occupation forces and their proxy terrorist groups, the WFP convoy that the Syrian government had approved months earlier was able to reach Sarmada in the northwest through a close line route from Aleppo in coordination with the Syrian Arab Red Crescent. This operation was successful as attested to by Mr. Griffiths. All relevant Syrian authorities have taken all the necessary measures to ensure a safe passage for the convoy and ensure the safety and security of UN staff and national staff. The soldier Munawar Hassan Salim paid the ultimate price and died in the line of duty as he was securing the passage of the convoy, a mine that terrorist groups, proxies to the Turkish occupation, had planted on the road, exploded. It's outrageous that some countries commend the Turkish regime at a time where this Turkish regime obstructs the deployment of an aid convoy from within Syria to a Tarab region. We strongly condemn this practice. The Syrian government had granted the UN approval to deploy this convoy a year and a, a, year and a half ago, and we renewed our approval to no avail. Upon approval, by the Syrian government and in close coordination with UN agencies and the Syrian Arab Red Crescent, an interagency convoy was deployed to Dara in the south. The WFP resumed its monthly programs and distributed food baskets there. After the convoy and humanitarian staff had arrived safely, and the aid reached the beneficiaries. As for the North East, I refer to the latest Secretary General's report contained in document S-2021-735. stroke stroke I quote, between January and July of this year, 1,588 trucks providing humanitarian assistance crossed lines into the northeast. An average of 227 a month compared with 199 a month in the same period in 2020. The WHO delivered three cross-line shipments 
including two airlifts and one road convoy. End of quote. The report stress once again that aid has been delivered to millions of Syrians in all 14 governorates, including food aid to around 4,800,000 people. All these achievements would not have been possible were it not for the cooperation and support provided by the Syrian government. Ladies and gentlemen, even if some hostile Western states continue to obscure these achievements, continue to promote the so-called cross-border mechanism and the fabricated reports by the Gaziantep office, my country will remain committed to delivering assistance from within Syria we will maintain our position to put an end to the politicized cross-border mechanism that violates our sovereignty and territorial integrity. We will expose the hostile role played by the Gaziantab office. Madam President, I have to address the inhumane effects of the coercive measures imposed by some Western states on Syria. They led to severe shortages in food, medication, medical supplies, fuel and electricity. My delegation stresses the need to address this issue as a matter of urgency, especially as the spread of COVID-19 constitute an additional threat to the health of the Syrians. The health sector in Syria is overstretched as a result of a shortage in medication, equipment and supplies, especially those needed to treat respiratory and cardiovascular diseases and cancer medication. Coercive measures prevent us from securing these supplies. Britain, for instance, that constantly claims to be committed to humanitarian action obstructed efforts to enhance the capacity of the health sector in Syria to fight COVID-19 by preventing specialized laboratories from obtaining the necessary supplies to carry out relevant tests. Madam President, the Syrian Arab Republic stresses once again that improving the humanitarian situation requires the following. One, the full respect of the sovereignty, independence, independence, unity and territorial integrity of Syria. All Security Council resolutions on the situation in my country stress this principle. Two, ending the illegal presence of Turkish and American occupation forces on Syrian territory and stop their practices that aim to perpetuate the crisis, support terrorism and proxy militias, in addition to stealing our economic resources. My delegation stresses the need to compel the Turkish regime to stop using water as a weapon of war against Syrians and using water for political purposes in order to ensure that the Alouk water station continues to be operational. And the Euphrates River flows at the rates agreed upon between countries and that citizens have enough water. Three, the immediate and unconditional lifting of immoral and inhumane blockade imposed by the United States and the EU on the Syrian people. It is a form of collective punishment, economic terrorism that extremely that is extremely detrimental to the efforts by the Syrian government in the humanitarian and development field. They prevent Syrians from fulfilling their basic needs. Four, honoring the declared pledges to finance the humanitarian response plan. As it stands, it is funded at only 
and we are already in the fourth quarter of the year. Five, supporting early recovery, early recovery projects referred to in Resolution 2585 and enhancing those projects quantitatively and qualitatively, rejecting any attempts by hostile countries to impose projects and programs that are not consistent with the Syrian national interests. Sixth, allowing the United Nations to reach an agreement with the Syrian government on the strategic framework that some Western governments continue to obstruct and then implementing said framework to ensure the support of sustainable development efforts and ensuring that no one is left behind. The United Nations and its allies The United States, rather, and its allies should refrain from pursuing such destructive approaches, should refrain from investing in terrorism and building illegal coalitions under the pretext of fighting terrorism. It should stop paying billions of dollars to wage futile wars that destabilize member states of this organization. In conclusion, Madam President, we are more than ready for a new chapter of cooperation. We will continue to facilitate the work of the United Nations and its specialized agencies while fully defending the sovereignty, independence, unity, and territorial integrity of the Syrian Arab Republic. We look forward to genuine partnerships that support the efforts by the Syrian state to restore peace and stability, provide assistance to civilians in need, enhance development efforts, and rehabilitate the infrastructure and facilities that are necessary for a safe, voluntary, and dignified return of the displaced to their homes. Thank you, Madam President. I thank the representative of the Syrian Arab Republic for his statement.